Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, um, Elucidata, for in, inviting us to present our work here. Um, I, I'm presenting on multi-omics integration in early stage drug discovery. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background on um, NCATS. I'm with NIH at the National Center for Advancing Translational Translational Sciences. Uh, we focus on translational research. It's an interesting um, place, having come from pharma, in that we our team is very relatively small, but we do have a biology, a medicinal chemistry, a computational group, as well as an admin group in a, in a small cohort, um, yet we can interact with NIH at large. So it's, a, it's an interesting and exciting uh, collaborative place to work. Uh, and on this project, our team um, consisted of you know, so Matt Hall at the uh, NCATS, Matt Hall leads our group. Um, Rick Schneider uh, did the metabolomics work actually at the um, Kibbe Iomics Core Lab, Metabolomics Core Lab. Uh, we collaborated with Lucidata, Sunil, and Mahi. Um, and also uh, Steve Ferguson is down at uh, uh, NIHS, and he was... Uh, an expert at HEPA RG cells, our hepatic model that we use, and um, Darren Dumau at SciEx was our um, metabolomic uh, expert on and consultant on the project. So, multiomics, a powerful approach to lead optimization. Cell-based models are, are routinely used in early stage drug discovery. That is, we're really good at cell-based um, models, anything from six wells to 3D4 well. We can screen, and with this is with a back-end mass spec um, readout, we have this particular mode of screening down. Likewise, uh, with lead optimization, um, and I'm, I'm kind of calling on lead optimization, throwing a, a wide net in that it's a central platform, um, and it's been very successful in drug discovery. And uh, you know, I, would, I would go so far as to say project teams and the organization is sort of um, organized around this general aim of lead optimization. Um, so we're kind of dropping multiomics into this well-established um, experimental as well as sort of um, strategic model that's currently active in drug discovery. So can we extend, well, how can we uh, multiomics be used to extend this theme and to build on our success um, to identify liabilities, for lack of a word, tox um, on target off target biochemistry, um, biomarkers, and other metabolic anomalies prior to clinical and preclinical development. Okay, so here's our, our test set. Um, we chose uh, the glitazone uh, template. So these three drugs, roseglitazone, pediglitazone, and troglitazone, share a common uh, thiolozilidone dione uh, template. Um, they were introduced about 20 years ago, 1997 through 2000. Roseglitazone and troglitazone were pulled off the market. Troglitazone only had about a three-year life on mar in the market, um, and it was pulled for liver tox. Roseglitazone had about uh, 10 years on the market, and it was pulled for cardiotox, and pioglitazone is still on the market. So these three... Cogeners have similar physiochemical and ADME properties. That is, they're drug-like. In fact, they're drugs, right? So they, uh, they measure up. But 20 years down the line, we know a lot about their pharmacodynamic, you know, we know that they're not, they're much different, right? Clinically, their outcomes in their um, life history is much different. So, and their pharmacodynamics, dosing regimen and off-target biochemistry and toxicity in that 20 year period, we've learned a lot and we know a lot. So all of the action sort of is below this, this red line here. Um, for triglitazone, this moiety is, this tocopherol moiety is, a, is essentially vitamin E, um, a vitamin E moiety. And um, 
to my eye, pioglitazone and, and rosy are very similar. Clinical outcomes are much different, but chemically, or I'm sure medicinal chemists would disagree with me, but they appear to be similar. So multiomic profiling, in this case, in a primary human hepatocyte model, may provide insight into the chemical biology that drives these uh, clinically important outcomes. What I'm excited to ask is, um, and I, you may ask is, what would your prediction be? As medic I'm, I would like to ask a medicinal chemist, what's your prediction on which of these two substrates will be most alike in terms of their metabolism? So I want to keep that in mind as we go forward on some of these slides. So I have a couple of examples um, showing how multiomics can can add to the our knowledge base around these uh, structures. So here's the basic um, workflow that we use. This is uh, our multiomic study, metabolomic and transcriptomic in a HEPA-RG model. Um, that's a primary hepatocyte model. We used L-MAVEN and, and polymetabolomics. Um, in L-MAVEN, we made a lot of use of their library functionality. That is, we had a, um, this is, the work of Rick Schneider up in uh, the Kibbe lab with um, several, a targeted library of about 600 molecules, um, metabolites from IROA based on, and we ran these through four different um, LC chemistries. And all of this, that is the retention time, the MS2 spectra are in our database. So we can do both a targeted approach, which is strictly um, that 600 compound library, we can do a semi-targeted approach where we can pull in uh, uh, other databases, a keg database, or we can do a completely untargeted approach and rely on uh, uh, mass accuracy and uh, to guide our interpretation. And so this, these libraries, this output is fed into uh, the Entomics algorithm uh, to, to guide our interpretation. So this is an, just... Um, Kind of another another view of that workflow. Uh, let me see if I have any notes here. So, what's kind of inherent in the poly platform is there. This is sort of a, um, a sandbox where you can try a different different ways of looking at the data. In our case, this may be a targeted library where we run it through uh, with our RNA seq data, and we kind of see what the network is looking like. These this would be a network where we have a high degree of confidence in the metabolite assignments. And then we can go back and, and feed in other, other libraries and see if they kind of uh, fit with our, with our burgeoning story, as it were, um, to understand the pathways that are, that are being impacted and how kind of the, the, metab the underlying metabolism in this model is shaking out. Okay, so here's an example, kind of a closer look at, um, at a dose response experiment or readout that we had. So this is rosglitazone at 10 micromolar uh, dose in a four hour hepatic model. And this is a 50 micromolar dose at four hours. And you can clearly see um, there's actually down regulation of uh, TCA metabolites um, isocitrate dehydrogenase is up at 50 micromolar. We, we're not picking it up at 10 micromolar. So, so this is um, what this kind of does is validate. Uh, by the way, four-hour hepatic models are are bread and butter and ADME screening. They're used all over the place. So we could plug this approach directly into what we're currently doing. Um, Another comment I'd like to make is my our experience with this particular rendering of metabolism has been very positive. That is showing the pathways, showing how um, gene, genes and metabolites are either upregulated or downregulated or not uh, or not found. Uh, really, really engages biologists. That is, uh, most my background is mostly bio bioanalytical and automation, so. It's really great when, when you walk into a room and you have a bunch of tables and, 
in maybe PCA charts or, or graphics, people have to sort of think abstractly and say, okay, how do I interpret this? Here, we gained immediate um, sort of buy-in from uh, the project team based on the graphic interface alone and our ability to um, describe how metabolism was shifting based on our perturbation. So it was really um, wonderful in, the, in that respect. Here's another example. Now, all of the, the glitazones, there's a known off-target um, alteration of steroid metabolism for um, across triglitazone, p-glitazone, rosy, and um, and we found that we saw that clearly in the HEPA RG model. So this is this is steroid metabolism here, steroid metabolism here. Interesting. Enough, triglitazone was the only substrate to uh, light up sterile metabolism. And this is also, um, this is due to its, thought to be due to its vitamin E um, functional group. And in fact, um, there's many publications on vitamin E alone, uh, tissues basically dumping cholesterol. So there's a vascular uh, indication here. And so this is this is this is a known thing. It's sort of validating the model, validating the approach. Secondly, as a bioanalytical scientist, I I know our bread and butter is putting together these markers and making up a screen on the fly. So from this information, we can quickly construct a screen. Um, we have a tool compound. We have triglitazone and rosy hitting either side of an interesting steroid pathway. These two pathway sterile, or sterile biosynthesis and uh, steroid metabolism are intimately connected, we can modulate this pathway with tool compounds and look at um, chemistry in essentially a lead optimization context. So this is sort of where we're, where we're headed with um, our multi-omic approach. Okay, so here's another example um, focused on energy metabolism, and energy metabolism is, is altered across the glutazone substrates. All of these interactions are supported via that 20 years of research on the substrates. And mainly what I want to point out here is ROSI was pulled, uh, one of the uh, initiation of cardiotox for ROSI, ROSI glutazone, was... Um, Dysreg dysregulation of mitochondrial oxidative uh, metabolism. And by the way, this is all targeted. All this work was done with um, a targeted uh, LCMS, and LCMS approach. And we're seeing a, a huge decrease in um, our, our key metabolites. You can't say succinate here, but it's also... Uh, highly significant and down-regulated. What's interesting is if you tend to, you tend to stare at these networks um, for a bit, and what's interesting is troglitazone and pioglitazone are actually, to, to, to the eye anyway, more similar than ROSI. And remembering the structural chemistry to an, you know, to an enthusiast more than an expert, um, Pioglitazone and ROSI are, are, are similar, whereas TRO is the outlier. So I would have predicted that the underlying biometabolism was, I'd expect it to be more similar between these substrates. Lo and behold, ROSI has the strongest impact on energy, energy metabolism, and that's been borne out. So if we had done this study at um, the project inception, and those three, you know, it's very common in drug discovery, right, to throw up those three structures in a meeting and say, okay, you know, which, how are we going to, you know, we're, who's the odd man out? Who are we going to go? Where are we going to place our bets? Which is the most modul modulatable chemistry? Yada, yada, a very project team focused approach. In the absence of this study, we don't have much to go on other than activity and, and add me and drug, drug likeness or whatever. Here, we're 
right away we're we're going to investigate this and we're going to see you know where where the liability is on sort of a different uh, more of a systems biology level so this was a very exciting um finding again it was a targeted approach so we have a high degree of confidence in this readout we would probably follow this or we expect to follow this with a um 13c label group um Luxomic study. Okay, so this, this study demonstrates that closely related structural cogeners can elicit dissimilar metabolic strategies to deal with perturbation. The results suggest that each cogener impacts the cellular system differently and the system responds in kind. So this is this is more, more or less a validation statement. Um, Based on this approach in the HEPA RG model, the Intomex algorithm. Now, this is a where we're, we anticipate this to be a screening approach, something that would be run at project inception, as well as along the life history as we move into from in vitro studies into in vivo to um, build our biomarker network, understand uh, understand the, how metabolism is shifting as we move across the um, in vitro the in vivo models. Um, so this is a validation, sort of a validation statement. So that was great. Um, now, based on, based on that, the Intomics profile of target this, this interaction, we think it adds a significant context in, in, elite, in lead optimization, in kind of the lead optimization context. Um, so this, this approach presents those opportunities to differentiate and fine tune the chemical biology associated with um, our lead active chemistry. And as, as such, we think it can potentially impact clinical outcomes. Uh, and we have, you know, so we have the model, we have the, the automation, um, and we're sort of off to the races on adding this type of workup to our lead optimization toolkit. Okay, something I wanted to mention about poly as an integrated omics approach. I think bioanalytical people and automation people in general in drug discovery, um, this would, this, the overall setup of poly is, is, is very appealing. That is, you can, you have a central hub of automation, and you can build your workflow on the fly. As um, Gotham said earlier, it's, it's it's highly customizable, but it's also something that a non-expert or a bioanalytical um, expert can can buy into and use pretty much out of the box. There's 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 workflows that can be um, tied together and you know, so from the automation and the streamlining our workflow and, and lending itself to screening, this this is a great um, advantage to the way Poly is sort of strategically designed and, and laid out with the ability to customize as well as um, build workflows on the fly as as you progress the project. And one stop shop. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, they're very easy, Kelly, um, to export and modify. Or, yep. Uh, in fact, that's that's the power of the uh, of that particular rendering of the graphics. So, um, yeah. And we do it all the time. Um, and all right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna sign off. I look forward to um, continuing to develop this emerging platform with uh, the help of our team and Elisa Data and uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Bye now.